Welcome back. Uh, so f before we uh, go on to the next talk, which is very interesting, which has very interesting title, and we are, I'm sure many of you are looking forward to it, I would take this opportunity to thank all the sponsors for Pi Data Conference, especially to, to Continuum Analytics, who has been our diamond sponsor and has essentially made this uh, event possible. In addition to that, we all also like to thank Blue Yonder, Clicks, AdSquare, and all our other sponsors who uh, did make a big, big effort to make this conference happen. So, uh, big thanks to all of them. <laughs> so we have Radim Rehurek, who is uh, who is going to tell us how to write Python code and make it run faster than the uh, big names out there. And uh, I, I will let him introduce himself, but uh, uh, okay, so I would like to tell him, I would just like to tell that he runs his own consulting firm and has been working with a number of companies before to show what to do with their data. So right. on to you. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. My name is Radim and today I'll be talking about optimizations. Now, many of you may have heard about deep learning, which is a bit of a hype lately. And uh, Google actually, can you hear me like this? I like to walk around, so maybe this is better. And Google published an algorithm called Word2Vac, which is a machine learning method, unsupervised machine learning method. After you train it, it can answer questions like, Berlin is to Germany as Paris is to, and Word2Vac, it doesn't work. Okay, I'll try to contain myself, but I really like to walk around. <laughs> All right, so, and the answer should be France. Or you can ask it, which of these words doesn't fit dinner, cereal, and it should tell you cereal. And now the fascinating thing about this is there is no manual input. You just give it a lot of text, just plain text sentences, sequences of characters, basically no lists of capitals, no notion of what is food and so on, and the model automatically learns these relationships just from plain text. So that's the interesting thing. Now, in order to do this, it needs a lot of data. And in the end, the relationships are captured by, by vectors. Each, each word is a vector of numbers. You can imagine it as 300 numbers. So you take the vector for king, subtract the vector for man, add the vector for woman and ask what is the nearest vector to that. And interestingly, word to back will tell you queen, which is what we would expect as well. But this talk is not actually about, about word to back itself or the math behind it, although that's interesting. It's more about the implementation because Google, they also released, along with the research paper, they released their own implementation. And now since this has to be trained on really large corpora, you can imagine hundreds of millions of sentences for it to perform well. It also needs to be super fast. So the implementation of Google is written in C, which is very tightly optimized. It's, it's a very nice, even beautiful code in, in, in the way that it's very compact and optimized. But it also fails on another account, which is it's supposed to be used for research. So people want to use it, extend it, maybe try some things differently. And it's not really possible with that implementation that we have from Google. Right, there's all these single letter variable names and, and no comments and, and I.O. mixed with all the computations and so on. So touching it is really a, a challenge. So what I did, I wanted to understand this model better for my own purposes. So I ported it to Python. So that's, that's one thing. I, I put a nicer interface, let's say. There was a lot of talk at this conference at PyData and also EuroPython about generators, so hopefully you know what that means. So instead of reading all the text from file as, as the original did, like one sentence per line, words in that sentence, instead the training comes from a generator. Each sentence is a list of words, as you can see there at the top, and it's really up to you what the generator does. It can read the sentences from disk, stream them from disk one sentence at a time, or you can read it from a zip disk or just compute something on the fly. It's up to you, it, it gives you much more flexibility. And connected to that, you can also plug into all the other libraries and, and the whole ecosystem of Python, which is amazing. So, for example, if instead of just 
using the words, let's say you want to lemmatize them. Okay? All the inflected forms of a single word, you want to represent them by a single token. So you can use pattern or NLTK for that, uh, Python libraries. Or at the end of that pipeline, let's say we already trained the word to VEC model and we want to do something with these word embeddings, with the vectors. Maybe we can improve our classification system, you know, plug it in somehow, continue the pipeline the other way. Again, Python has a lot of very interesting libraries, scikit-learn and so on. We, we also heard a lot about them at this conference. So that's pretty nice. And a nice Pythonic interface, instead of writing Python code, we can use that. So that's all very nice, but how about performance? The, that's, that's one problem. So, of course, it uses vectors, it uses matrices, so naturally my port used NumPy, which is like the standard in the Python world for working with that type of stuff. And I wrote the NumPy code to be fairly optimized. So I used the vector operations, and sometimes even nested loops could be expressed as a single matrix operation. So I tried to plug into the strength of NumPy, which is using the, the internal compiled routines rather than pure Python loops. And I was pretty happy with the result. It, it was most of the time, this I would just call it a day and use that. But actually, this NumPy optimized NumPy code was still 20 times slower than the C implementation which is not good. And we're not talking about milliseconds. This is like a difference between, between training for a day and a training for three weeks. So, so the difference is huge. So I had to dig deeper. Unluckily, that meant translating some of the nice Python stuff back into C stuff. But luckily, this is a typical HPC application, which means there's a tiny core of computation that takes a lot of time. And the rest doesn't matter all that much. About 20 lines of code consume 90% of the runtime. So what I did is I translated this tiny core into Cython, which is one of the ways of plugging into low-level routines. And after some profiling and debugging and so on, making sure we don't make any temporary copies, avoiding dynamic allocations by pre-allocating arrays and, and various other tricks, I managed to match the speed of the C implementation. All right, so now we have a core uh, code, a port that is Pythonic and nice, and a little bit of it is translated back into C, basically. So that's a success, but this is Python, so we can do better than C. So I continued optimizing. Now this may be getting maybe a little bit obscure. I don't know how many of you know BLAS. Basically, that's a, BLAS stands for Basic Linear Algebra Subroutines. And you can, as an example, imagine you have a vector of numbers, x. You want to multiply each, each element of that uh, vector by a, a, a scalar, and add the result into another vector. Pretty primitive operation. And if you write that loop that you see on top in C, your compiler will generate pretty reasonable code. But the fact is BLAS is very highly optimized. So if you use a BLAS library to do the same thing, it will actually use very specific instructions for your architecture, and it will take good care of cache, processor caches and translation look aside buffers and so on to really squeeze all the performance from your hardware. So what I did was I translated that core routine from, from loops, from, from C, into using these BLAS uh, routines. It wasn't easy because from Actually, NumPy and SciPy, they already wrap BLAST, but we can't go from C to, to Python and call something back that would kill the performance. So we have to directly call these routines from C. And after a bit of digging, I came up with what you see at the bottom, which works well. And we can do that. And the result is three times faster execution. So before we were at the C speed, and now we are three times faster, which is, which is pretty nice. Putting it all together. This is actually a screenshot from the initial port. Since then, other people contributed more optimizations and so on. So putting all the optimizations together, which is the bottom right number, it's about 100 times faster now than the NumPy baseline. Yeah, so the takeaway, optimize NumPy, we can still optimize it about two orders of magnitude if we, had, if we are careful about the memory and so on, if you put a effort into it. And I was also interested in going the other direction because I'm sure you've seen these benchmarks where people write 
crappy algorithms, and crappy implementations, and then they improve it a million times. So I was a bit sad that I don't see that because I write reasonable code from the start. So I went the other direction and I rewrote the NumPy baseline in pure Python just to see how much we get uh, from NumPy itself. And the, the answer is another two orders of magnitude. Okay, so, so from pure Python to nice NumPy, 100 times faster, and from nice NumPy to like, thoroughly optimized code, another, two, and a, another 100, so about 12,000 put together. And I also think this is an interesting benchmark because uh, on its own, without needing talking about deep learning or anything like that, because people benchmark usually on stuff that nobody cares about, like Fibonacci numbers, yeah, that's the, one of the com common benchmarks. And actually, word to vec is a self-contained simple application, which is what you want in benchmark. It has the high performance requirements and so on. At the same time, it's complex enough that people want to use, they even want to pay for it to have it implemented and use it. So it's, nobody will pay you for generating Fibonacci numbers. So this is an interesting, uh, uh, benchmark. So uh, this is just one data point, so we can't generalize too much, but if you never worked with this stuff before, this is what you could expect from, a, from an application that needs performance. Yeah, here I prepared some advanced infographics for you. The top image is how the original impl C implementation works. This slide is about Parallelization. So far, everything I said was about single core running it just in one one process, one on one core. And the original implementation works on a file which is in a fixed format. It's not flexible. That's what I mentioned. It just splits this file into equal segments, into equal number of bytes, and each worker, each thread processes its segment. Now, it, it's this part is not very nicely coded. I think this is the ugliest part of the original C because. When you seek into the middle, into some byte, you can be seeking into the middle of a sentence or middle of a word or even middle of a, of a character in case of multi-byte encodings. And also from there it processes a fixed number of words. Not bytes, but words. So if there are short words in its segment, maybe it finishes earlier and some part of the file is never trained on. Or if the words are long, maybe it goes beyond the, where the other worker starts and it trains multiple times on the same. It's a bit messy. So instead, the, the port, which is the bottom picture, there is, the sentences come from a stream, from the generator, so there is no seeking into the middle. We just have a sequence of, sequence of uh, sentences we can go over. So I put them into, chunk them into jobs for performance reasons, and these jobs are put into a queue from which each worker lifts the job and processes it fast, quickly. This is possible because we're already working on sea level, so we can afford to release the, the guild, the global interpreter log, so this is, this is fast with threats. How does it work? Pretty well. With uh, two cores, we get about 1.75 speed up. With four cores, 2.85. This is a bit worse than in the C version where you get 1.9 and 3.2, respectively. It's because we're doing a bit more in the Python. We're doing some locking and doing the job queuing and it has to be thread safe and so on. So there's a bit more overhead. And also interesting, if you look at the, bot at the top table, there's also accuracy. Now accuracy, you can evaluate the model in terms of how well it performs. You have a, this set of questions like Berlin is to Germany as France is. And if the model gets it right, it's a success, otherwise failure, and you can represent it by a single number at the end. And the port actually performs better. It gets better accuracies because we got rid of a lot of the artifacts that were in the original, which, are, which were not really necessary for the algorithm. It was just the way it was implemented in, in C and fix some other stuff. So it's, it's much nicer, more extensible. It's faster, and it's also qualitatively better. So it's like a triple win here. So it's, it's a nice, in my opinion, port. Okay, what didn't go so well? Cython has a thing called type memory views for accessing arrays, which is supposed to be the way to do it. 
I couldn't get it to perform as well as just plain pointers. And I didn't see much point. So I spent some time on it and in the end I just dumped memory views and, and wrote raw pointers. Cython's dynamic compilation. I didn't want to make the port dependent on Cython because a lot of people don't really use the training. Instead they just download an already trained model and they want to use the the nice Pythonic interface to ask questions of the model. That's a perfectly valid use case. So when something goes wrong and you can, can't compile it, the, the, the Cython version, I fall back to the NumPy version. And I use dynamic compilation for that. And I thought it was very nice of Cython to, to do that. But then one user reported a problem with it. And I asked on the Cython mailing list. And they said that actually you shouldn't do that. It's a horrible thing to do for some reasons that I didn't really understand. But that was a big disappointment. So you can't do that in Cython, dynamic compilation. Bless. Now, bless was the difference why we are actually faster by the factor of three that I talked about a bit earlier. And I talked to Tomáš, who is the author of, uh, who was a Googler and author of the original implementation. Now he's left Google. He's moved on to the new Facebook uh, AI lab. But of course, he was he's well aware of BLAS. And when I asked him, why, why didn't you use it? Why didn't you get this extra uh, boost in speed? Uh, his reason was very good, very respectable, and that's because BLAS is a pain in the ass. It's, it's difficult to, to maintain because you have to think about all these wrappers and it's, uh, these libraries, these super fast libraries come with their own problems and Fortran and binary interfaces and so on. So he didn't want to deal with that. That, that was the reason. And now NumPy and SciPy, they shield us from a lot of it, but not all of it. So. For example, in SciPy, if, if you multiply on, on certain, uh, with certain BLAST libraries, such as the one that comes with Apple computers, it's called Accelerate. If you multiply two vectors in, in single precision, you get the wrong result uh, when you do it through SciPy, because there's some incompatibility or whatever. So, so there's a lot of, it's a bit annoying. You get, NumPy shields you from a lot of it in SciPy, but there's still, it sometimes leaks through and it can be nasty. And then Python 3, actually I, the port is now lives as part of Gensim, which supports both Python 2 and Python 3 from the same code base. And keeping it, keeping all the optimizations working in both Pythons, there was a, or some minor glitches, but it's fixed, it works now, nothing, nothing too bad. And that brings me to the last slide. First of all, thanks to Tomáš Mikolov for his original implementation, for doing the research and all the really hard work, and also to Google for releasing it, including training it on the internal, internal data and releasing the model. That was very nice. So people like me can just play around with optimizations, which is the easy part. They, they did all the hard work. Uh, practical information, the... The port lives in Gensim, like I said, you can find it on GitHub. As I was porting it, I was writing a series of blog posts about, uh, about how it went and how it didn't go. So if you want to read it in more detail at your own pace, that's the link at the bottom. And at the top is uh, my contact information. Like uh, I was introduced, I, I run a small dev and consulting company where we specialize in machine learning. So if, if you have a need of some recommendation engine or content filtering or ad targeting and so on, you can, you can talk to me. The contact is there if you just want to discuss what was done here. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you for that nice and quick overview. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question regarding the memory usage. So okay. You, you, you basically, for that example, you had like double the memory in RAM. Talking about this table, huh? Yes. Well spotted, yeah. The, the yeah. Python part takes, or what is your question? The question is, is this a linear growth? As in like if I get uh, like enough data to have a half a giga uh, for, C vec, for the C version, will I have a one giga in usage or just a specific overhead? 
It, it takes about double the amount of memory. Constantly. Yeah? But yeah, that's what I want to say. This, the point is that it's streamed. Yeah? The generators mean we just train on one sentence and then we forget it. We don't like load the entire 100 billion words into memory at once. So the memory is constant. No matter how large the training corpus is, you're using about, this is like, again old, now it's a bit less, but let's say 500 megabytes of memory. Good question. Uh, have you tried Numba because you implemented a pure Python version over there? Speaking, you implemented uh, a pure Python version uh, what, that is uh, two orders of magnitude slower, right, uh, than the best one you got. Uh, have you tried Numba because sometimes, if it works, <laughs> uh, you get two orders of magnitude speed up. Uh, so have you tried it? Yeah, good question. No, I haven't. I think it's just adding one decorator to your Python code yeah. in theory. <laughs> Okay, so maybe you can try. But this is interesting, like I talked here about that I think it's a good benchmark because it's big enough and at the same time compact enough. So I think this is actually a, a good direction. Try different, maybe Numba, like you say, which I haven't tried, but maybe there are other tools that could be useful. And we can compare it on a realistic task. So that's, I think that's, that's a nice feature of this. Hey, Radim. Um, so, uh, um, on the point of number, certainly number and PySRAN might be interesting things, because as you say, this is an, an interesting real-world benchmark. Um, and with your original C Python implementation, I guess a PyPy test as well could be uh, an interesting an interesting way to lose a week uh, in, uh, going through the, the benchmarking possibilities. Um, but a real, it's a good test. Um, I'm curious about the about your thoughts on engineering performant code with Python. Uh, for deployment scenarios. So one thing that I and others, uh, when teaching things like Scython, we talk about the best way to get speed, but not necessarily the best way to make well-engineered code that's easy and robust for a team to maintain. You're a team of one, so it's a bit easier, but you've made some, uh, some really fast solutions. How do you deal with the trade-off between ultimate speed and maintainability? Sorry, I didn't understand the question fully. Oh, sorry. Um, you can make some really, really good optimizations, but it will make the card, the code hard to maintain in the future. Okay. How do you make the trade-off between maintainability and speed for you know, this and other I have, yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank you. That's uh, another good point. I already mentioned it a little bit when I talked about blast being pain in the ass. That's exactly the point where it starts getting tricky when you have to maintain these various connections to the various underlying libraries that actually make you fast. So if you look at the, the initial port was pretty concise, but if you look at the, the core function that was ported into Cython and optimized with blast, if you look at it now in, inside Gensim, it's a pretty long piece of code with a lot of nasty gotcha <laughs> fixes and, and, and branching. So the trade-off I make there is as long as it depends on how much performance we get because one thing I didn't talk about here is the, the sigmoid table optimization. And I didn't really mention that and it's a special optimization that was there in the original C tool where you pre-compute some of the functions into memory. And that's something that was very popular many, many years ago, because you offload CPU and instead you use RAM. But now we have such complex architectures and, and the cache hierarchies are so complex that I actually thought this would be a regression. I didn't want to implement it, but I did. And it was about 4% faster than, than without this optimization. So in my opinion, this is not really worth the code complexity. So if it was up to me, I would just, well, it is up to me, but just ignore this optimization. and and go for maintainability without that extra code and extra thinking about what this does and how does it work. So it's a trade-off, like you say. Hello, that was a very interesting talk, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, this tool Gensim or Gensim. Gensim. Uh, are you gonna give another talk about that one or could you maybe just in, in a few sentences explain what that is? Sure, so Gensim is a tool for uh, large-scale semantic modeling. I'm, I'm the author, actually, so that, that's why this is a part of Gensim. And it uh, specifically uses that pattern that we saw with, with data streaming. 
a lot of machine learning libraries, text processing or otherwise, they load everything into RAM into a, like a large NumPy array or whatever, and then work with that. But in, in NLP, usually the corpora are very large, and you don't want to load everything into RAM. So GenSim speci specifically targets that scenario where the data is large, and you can just stream through it and update the models online. Yeah, without without doing maybe batch processing, just go through the stream and update models. Apart from word to work, you can find latent semantic analysis and latent Dirichlet allocation and these types of algorithms. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So on the subject of maintainability, um, Another problem faced by people working with uh, with larger packages is going to be correctness of the code. Um, you've mentioned problems with BLAS and cross-platform compatibility. Can you talk a little bit about your test strategy, unit tests, coverage, uh, your strategy of testing on multiple operating systems, just, just how you're confident it will work? You mean specifically for work to vec here? Here it was a bit... It was a bit uh, easier because when, usually when you implement algorithms from academic papers, you're pretty much on your own. Uh, if you've ever done it, you know it's, it's not an easy task because there's just these formulas and sometimes they're wrong and so on. But here it was easier because we had already had a referential implementation, the, the C code from Google, from Tomáš. So one way of, while developing it, of testing it was just by comparing if it does what it should. And like I said, the port is not one-to-one. -one. This is a re-implementation of the original ideas, not just translation of code. Uh, but as long as we're getting better accuracies, we're fine. So that, that's one way of testing. And then there's unit testing, which is maybe what you meant, like seeing that we don't break something. And there are unit tests in, in Python for this. Standard stuff. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay, if that's not the case, let's thank our speaker once again. <laughs>